Good morning, and welcome to The Peorian. I'm your host, Paul Gordon. As I sit comfortably in our air-conditioned studio, it would be easy to forget that the temperature outside is nearing three digits, and that there has not been appreciable rainfall in weeks. But the weather, the heat, and what many believe are drought conditions, is on the minds of most of us in Peoria, indeed the whole Midwest. Farmers are hurting, grass is burning up, and heat-related health problems are worsening, to name just a few issues. We've seen this before, and eventually things return to normal. But is this becoming the new normal? Is the weather we are having now a harbinger of climate change, or is it evidence we are already experiencing climate change? There is some scientific evidence that either statement could be, could be true. The EPA says that with climate change, the Midwest will experience hotter summers with longer dry periods and milder, wetter winters. That sure looks like the case this year, doesn't it? There are still a lot of skeptics about whether climate change is real or not and whether global warming, considered by many scientists as the chief culprit behind climate change, is really a factor. My guest today is local meteorologist Chuck Collins, who believes climate change is real. We'll discuss that and other weather issues when we come back. Welcome back to the Peorian. My guest today is Chuck Collins, Chief Meteorologist for WEEK and WHOI TV. Welcome to the show, Chuck. My pleasure, Paul. <laughs> Baby, it's hot outside. Yeah, it's so hot, it's so dry. Now, the potatoes in my garden, they're already baked. So all you need is salt and pepper and you're good to go. Bring them over. <laughs> yeah, that's hot it is. Is this an anomaly or is this a sign of things to come? Yeah, uh, this is, we've always had drought. Yeah. We've always had, you know, climate change. We've always had weather cycles. So, you know, we were due for a drought. The big question is, uh, why is it so intense and widespread? And that's one thing we'll have to study over the next several months. Certainly, this is a big anomaly as far as droughts are concerned. Droughts are not uncommon, but once again, the entire nation, about 60% of the nation is considered in drought. All of Illinois is drought or worse. So wow. this needs to be studied very carefully after it's all said and done. The scary thing, we're still a month and a half away from you know, getting into fall. So this has another you know, several weeks to go because we're only in you know, mid to late July. Is there any... Uh Relief in sight? I don't see any. I, I've looked at things through the middle of August and uh, pretty much day in, day out, uh, at least 90 degrees, if not a little bit hotter, uh, maybe upper 80s. Uh, rain chances uh, pretty slim. <laughs> and in fact, the, the only rain over the next maybe, you know, 15 days or so that we're seeing of any consequence is amazingly in the desert southwest, the monsoonal type moisture in New Mexico and Arizona, places like that. <clears throat> Otherwise, most of the country remains dry, except maybe for the extreme west coast. Is climate change <clears throat> real? Yeah, uh, it is. And, and we know uh, global warming causes climate change. We know global warming is real. Our uh, worldwide temperature, atmospheric temperature, is up anywhere from one to three degrees since the turn of the since, since 1900, since the beginning of uh, the Industrial Revolution, so to speak. And it really accelerated in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, slowed down in the 2000s. But we know global warming exists because our atmosphere, our world, is warmer than it ever has been. Uh, the result of that is climate change. We've seen that. Some of the poles, we've had melting at the poles. We've had ice shelves and even icebergs break off because they're melting. We know it's happening. To what extent, I think that's the big debate on what the big term, uh, what the short term, and especially the long term effects of climate change will be. And who knows, this drought, once it's studied, may not have been caused by climate change, but the intensity may have been affected by climate change. Okay. now. You're talking about since the turn of the century or since the last century, right. the temperatures have gone up. Then how do we explain that the hottest summer on record in Peoria was in 1936? 1936. That was the Dust Bowl years of 34, 35, and 36. We had drought in the midsection of the country in the plains. A lot of that was man-made. A lot of people don't realize that the government paid farmers to move out to the plains to farm rural areas. A lot of prairie grassland, prime prairie grassland, was farmed. So that turned it into dirt, and when a drought came along, that actually added fuel to the fire. So the 36 drought was man-made, a lot of it, by 
just uh, you know droves of farmers being paid by the government to uh, farm land out on the plains, Kansas, Nebraska, where they wanted to populate those areas. They took good prairie grass, turned it into farmland, and it just didn't work out well. So that was a big problem in the in the mid '30s with the Dust Bowl. As far as the drought goes, right. As far as the what drought about the, the temperature? Being, yeah, uh, uh, and obviously, I, I think that was just a situation where the the old saying goes, "Dry breeds heat, heat okay. breeds dry." Once you get into the a dry cycle, you're into a heat cycle. Once you're in a heat cycle, you're in a dry cycle, and the cycle continues, and it's a vicious cycle like we're in right now. So that, that does not shoot holes into the global warming theory? I don't think so. And, and, and early on in the 30s, you know, we, we had started, uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution had been going about 30 years. We had been putting stuff into the atmosphere, into the ground, mm -hmm. into the water, but it hasn't been, you know, it wasn't a prolonged time yet. But that was just a flat out and out drought. But like I said, a lot of it was due to farming practices because uh, of tillage of uh, rather, you know, green and lush areas, if you will, in the plains that was turned into the farmland. Maybe not the greatest idea in the world because that helped with the dryness and the heat as well. Most of what, a lot of scientists believe that most of what we're experiencing today is of our own doing as well. Yeah, you exactly. Agree? I, I agree. Uh, you know, uh, before the EPA came along, it's hard telling what we actually put into our air our ground, our water, we have no way of knowing. And, you know, the EPA came along uh, years later after, in, after the Industrial Re Re Revolution began. Uh, so I think uh, that's a big part of it. And as I tell people out in the community, and we can get into this later, on what they can do to, you know, uh, maybe slow down the amount of greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere, which is, you know, a cause of global warming and eventually climate change, but yeah, most of it's, uh, most of it's man-made as what we put in the atmosphere, yeah. Okay. And in our lifetime, it's going to just continue, but it's right. going to be our grandchildren who are Exactly. Going. Two or three generations down the road. Uh, in fact, uh, like I said, uh, th there's evidence that maybe droughts like this, even the hurricane cycle that we uh, culminated in 05, mm -hmm. that was a cycle, a naturally occurring hurricane cycle, but Global warming or climate change may have actually made that more intense that year than normally would have been. Okay. When we come back, we'll talk more about global warming and whether the trend can be reversed or merely slowed. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Pure Inn. I'm with meteorologist Chuck Collins, and we're talking about climate change and its causes. As I understand it, Chuck, most who study the climate and weather patterns and such, including yourself, believe the effects of global warming cannot be reversed. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, once you get a hole in the ozone layer, it's kind of hard to fill in. I mean, it's not like the human body; it doesn't heal. Uh, we, we can we can uh, do things to create. Um, situations where we don't damage it anymore, but I'm not sure if there's if, if we can go back on that because we know there are you know a few holes in the ozone layer, which allows uh, greenhouse gases to form. It's just like a greenhouse it allows certain ultraviolet rays in, but not escape. And it's sort of you know, it's the greenhouse effect that that warms us up. So I'm not sure if we can go back. So the only thing we can do is to do preventative measures, slow it down as much as we can. And Mother Nature does a balancing act. Weather is a balancing act. It balances drought and floods. It balances hurricanes. Hurricanes, you know, uh, have, have a purpose. They take energy from one section of the world, transfer it to another section of the world. So weather is a balancing act. We can't rule out Mother Nature of trying to repair things naturally, but uh, it's one of those things where we, you know, we, we may not be able to repair what's, what's been done completely, just go on from here and try and prevent more from, from happening. Is there any evidence that Possibly it is repairing itself? Yeah. Um, that's a good question uh, because uh, volcanoes, for instance, back in 1990, at, at the really beginning of the height of the global warming debate, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines blew. It actually put so much ash and, and, and sulfur and, and ingredients into the atmosphere, it actually cooled the atmosphere oh. by a couple of degrees. 
the problem. We don't want volcanoes exploding all the time doing that, and we don't want to put pollution in the air like Asia does. Uh, because that's kind of slowed down the process because China especially, a lot of pollution, they put a lot of stuff in the atmosphere and actually has slowed down the global warming a little bit because of countries continuing to pollute heavily. We don't want to slow it down that way. But Mother Nature, you can't rule her out because she balances weather all the time. She may be able to overcome some of this during the natural process. Is El Nino evidence of global warming at all? No, El Nino and La Nina are uh, patterns that uh, we've known for centuries that occur every two to seven years. We just came out of a very strong La Nina cycle and the reason why we're seeing I think the drought is because on the backside of La Nina, which is a cooling of the equatorial Pacific, once La Nina dies down we've had some of our most severe droughts including 88 was the backside of a very strong La Nina pattern. That's what we're seeing now. So drought isn't surprising Right now it's just the intensity, but La Nina and El Nino uh, come and go every two to seven years, depending on what pattern we're in, depends on how it affects our weather. I guess I was under the impression that they've started coming more frequently. Yeah. They haven't? Not, not really. Uh, okay. But like I said, there's, there's indications they may be intensified by what's going on globally okay. in, in, in the uh, you know, global community and global atmosphere. What can be done to slow global warming? Yeah. And people ask me this all the time because I talk to groups and, and, and talk to individuals about it. As far as individuals are concerned, um, we need to recycle. We, we have to reduce what we're putting in our landfills. Landfills are naturally, uh, when, when everything decays, it automatically puts greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, so whatever we can do to reduce what we put in the landfill, um, so that means recycling, um, that'll cut down. I've started it, you know, uh, with a big 95, uh, you know, gallon totes. And uh, it's amazing what I recycle versus what I throw away now. And, and people will find that amazing. Um, also, you know, we don't expect people to stop driving, but, you know, uh, be more frugal as far as planning your trips, maybe not running all over town if you don't have to, kind of plan out where you want to go, not use the car as much. Um, things like that. Uh, I tell people I'm not giving up my power mower, but make sure it's in good running shape. Maybe have your lawn mowed a little bit shorter. Of course, a lot of us don't have to worry about it now because right. it's brown. Uh, but, you know, keep, keep it shorter. Don't use the power equipment as much as you need to. And maybe turn the thermostat up or down, depending on the season, a couple of degrees. Because uh, if we can uh, reduce the amount of uh, energy that uh, power plants have to put out, because once again, that goes into the atmosphere, the byproducts, if we can reduce that, so those are a few things we can do as individuals, and of course the the industrial community and the governmental community and oversights they have to you know keep that in check as well. So okay, we're going to take a break now for messages from sponsors, and when we come back, I'll ask about the drought conditions we now are facing and how it may affect not only farmers but the economy. But first, here is Kevin Kevin Kaiser to talk about what's going on in the literary and culinary world. Hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. This week, another very special episode of Kevin Reads Stuff So You Don't Have To. This time, it's the culinary edition, and the book is Beard on Food, the best recipes and kitchen wisdom from the Dean of American Cooking by James Beard. James Beard was a writer and chef often credited with establishing America's gourmet food identity in the late 50s. Beard had an eccentric personality, which is more of the norm in the culinary world. He's known today primarily for the James Beard Foundation, which provides scholarships to aspiring chefs and champions the American culinary tradition which Beard himself helped to create. In fact, there's a Peoria connection to the story. Josh Adams, the award-winning chef at June in Peoria Heights, is a recent James Beard Award finalist. Now, over his lifetime, Beard wrote 20 books covering all kinds of culinary subjects, including quite a few on outdoor and fireside cooking. Beard on Food was originally published in 1974, and this American kitchen classic remains in print to this day and for a very good reason. In this book, Beard collected his own favorite writings on topics ranging from the perfect hamburger and scrambled eggs to the pleasures of oxtail and the joy of pickling. It can be said that Beard taught a whole new generation of home cooks to say, I can pickle that. Altogether, Beard on Food is an invaluable reference for cooks of any level, and Beard's writing makes it a fun and entertaining read, especially when he delves into the more obscure corners of the culinary world with stories about syllabubs and fools. Syllabubs are an old English dessert. How old? Well, Beard tracked down an early recipe that called for combining a half pound of sugar, a pint of cider, and some nutmeg, then taking the mixture out to the cow for three pints of fresh milk. Fools are an old English dessert, which involves slowly cooking down the berry of your choice with lots of sugar, straining the mixture through a sieve, and then mixing it with whipped cream and serving. And there are all kinds of great bits about food-related information in this book. For instance, did you know avocados used to be known as alligator pears? Well, they were. 
Did you know that strawberry was actually a member of the rose family, genus Fregoria? Well, now you do. Beard reveals that one of the best blue cheeses in the world is made by a name better known for appliances. Yes, Maytag cheese from Iowa was created by the same Maytags who make dishwashers. And finally, Bing cherries, even though they were first grown in America, were named for a Chinese gardener here who developed the large dark cherry by crossing various varieties. Oh, and the British like ground pepper on blueberries. Actually, try it sometime. It's not that bad. So that's Beard on Food, the best recipes and kitchen wisdom from the Dean of American Cooking. And that's another episode of Kevin Reed's Stuff So You Don't Have To, Culinary Edition. And as always, you are welcome. I'm back talking with meteorologist Chuck Collins about, well, the weather. That's what he does <laughs> best. At the break, Chuck, I brought up the current weather conditions. Right. And there's an even bigger issue than just the heat, and that's... We are in a drought, right. are we not? Yeah, full-fledged drought, 60% nationwide. All of Illinois is at least in a moderate or severe or extreme drought. Illinois is really hit hard. There's only a couple of areas in northern Illinois which we would consider abnormally dry, which would be a good thing for most of us, but most of the state uh, is in a severe or moderate drought situation. Obviously, that's affecting the crops. Uh, beans were planted virtually in dust. So uh, there's obviously consideration about the beans, although the bean growing season is still going on. The corn was planted in good soil at a good time, but it hasn't had any moisture, so there's a real concern about the corn crop because we're seeing corn ears the size of pickles or yeah. carrots yeah. out there. And that will be statewide, so the corn crop is really going to be hurt. And, you know, from a consumer standpoint, yeah, we, uh, you know, we feed cattle with corn. We use corn in our, in, in our food. So eventually by the fall, you're going to see uh, probably food prices go up anywhere from five to ten percent from what I've, I've seen and just the uh, you know psychological situation of, of being in a flat-out drought like we are what what exactly constitutes a drought has to do with uh, just uh, uh, soil moisture down to four inches uh, the amount of soil moisture uh, there's very little uh, especially in southern Illinois there may be about a tenth of an inch down to four inches you should have a lot more than that around here maybe a quarter if we're lucky so it's determined by a lot of things, uh, uh, future, uh, you know, uh, future forecast, past forecast, rainfall, expected rainfall, but topsoil moisture especially and topsoil temperature. That's one reason why all the farmers got corn in early because we had such a mild spring, had pretty good moisture early on. They got the corn in early, the ground temperatures were warm, but boy, it's, uh, it's just gone downhill after that. How far out can you predict a drought? Um, usually, uh, you can predict uh, drought cycles, especially some climatologists can, out, out several years. Uh, I, I think this one pretty much we saw, when we especially when we get to a La Nina situation, you can okay. expect uh, sometimes back-to-back -back droughts. And actually, our drought is an extension of last July and August. We technically were in drought conditions last July and August. We had a virtual snowless winter because we had 11 inches of snow, 26 is normal. We had a mild spring and, a, and, and some uh, pretty good rainfalls in the spring, but then it shut off. So actually, our drought here extends back to July of last year because, uh, let's see, 11 months above normal temperatures the past 12 and 9 months below normal precip during the past year. So ours actually got started last July uh, in, in the middle of the summer. How far off are we on rainfall? Uh, going into today, uh, we're about seven, so we're seven behind in total precip, and that's after getting an inch officially in Peoria, you know, a few weekends ago. Uh, but we're down about seven, headed for eight now as the deficits. And uh, July, we've got some timely rains, but very scattered, and uh, nothing widespread and soaking like we need, and uh, it uh, just adds to the uh, humidity, too, in the air. So most of the showers we're getting here recently, and we'll expect... The only thing they'll do is be very localized and uh, you know, steam up the place as well. So. so it doesn't really help the farmers? No, we those, need something those. widespread. We need a three or four day, two or three inch rain over 20, 30 counties, at least here in central Illinois, to really even charge the soil. I think the corn crop's pretty much been written off. I mean, a lot, a lot of fields will be mowed down here pretty soon wow. because of that. So we're looking at uh, just now, just getting moisture, just to charge up wells, charge up the topsoil and the subsoil and prepare for next year's agricultural season, basically, is what we're doing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there is no, you're not seeing in the forecast any of that widespread 
No, uh, not uh, through at least the middle of August that we see and maybe on into the end of August as well. It just uh, looks like the pattern continues to be these very scattered situations. And once you get a drought pattern in place, even a small to medium sized storm system that comes through, the dry air just eats it up and shears it apart. And we have to have almost a tropical type influence, maybe a tropical storm remnants to come out of the Gulf of Mexico up the Mississippi River. That would be one way. But right now the tropics are pretty uh, calm as well, so there's not much going in the tropics. Last time we saw a drought this bad, 1988? 88 uh, is, is pretty much it. Um, and of course we didn't have the drought resistant crops that we do, so a lot of corn just burned up in the field. I mean, it just went brown. So we do have green corn and we'll be looking at maybe 50 bushels an acre, some farmers are saying, instead of maybe 75 or 100. It may even be less than that, but at least there's drought resistant you know, crops that we have as opposed to 1988, but uh, yeah, that was a serious year as well. Okay. I hope you've enjoyed today's program and that we helped you understand a bit more about climate change and how it affects all of us. Remember that you can see this and other episodes of The Peorian on our website, thepeorian.com, and tune in for another episode next Sunday at 8 a.m. on WHOI TV. And don't forget, too, we are on Facebook, so find us there and like us. Have a good week. Thank mm -hmm. you.